Welcome. So, uh, welcome everyone to the breakout session uh, for the Showcase 5, Water Resources Management. My name is uh, uh, Nuno Grosso. I work in Demos Engineering based here in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, and I want to do a short introduction of the showcase before passing the word to the different pilots um, that will have a seven minute presentation, each pilot, so that we can then have a 45, hopefully 45 minute um, uh, time for discussion. So after each pilot's presentation, if you have like, like a really urgent question, we, we, are, we are able to, 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 um, uh, to answer that uh, in between the different pilots. If not, you can also wait for the discussion. The, part, the first part, we can dedicate a bit to uh, any question that you have about the pilot. So I'll share my screen with you. Just wait. Share screen. I hope you can all see my presentation. Yes. So I you can, Panelist? Uh, yeah. Can yeah. right now? Thanks. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. So uh, when we first, uh, I think uh, almost three years ago, maybe even more, uh, start thinking about the showcase water resources management, we saw that it was a, a, a very wide transversal social, social challenge that requires an integrated approach. It encompasses a lot of European directives and policies, the, from the water framework directive to the marine strategy framework directive, the floods directive, the integrated coastal management. So it, it encompasses a lot of different areas and it's, it will be a challenge to try to cover them all. But we wanted to be as diverse as possible and cover as much as, of thematic areas as we could, focusing on the geo priorities and, and SDGs represented there. So the water resources, clean water and, and sanitation, live below water, climate action and affordable and clean energy. Uh, hopefully we were able to do so, not only in terms of thematic areas, but also in terms of the representativity of the different players within the industry for this area. So we are represented here by different institutions, uh, inst public institutions and also private ones. And that diversity, I think, adds to the, um, to the appeal of, uh, uh, and to the, to the experience uh, of, this, uh, of this showcase. So our main objective is to implement these five pilots. Now we have added pilots and I hope uh, uh, the, the one, the people in the new pilots are, are can join this uh, this uh, this session and can bring their uh, their uh, new energy also to the to the showcase. And I hope to be talking to them uh, to, with them uh, through this session. But in the, in the beginning, it was five pilots, and they should be they are they should be representative of this wide range of thematic areas within water resources management, from the characterization of inland water quality and quantity to water bodies and flood mapping, coastal water visibility and quality, algal blooms detection and monitoring, and maritime human activities monitoring. We, in the, within, the, within the project, aim to increase the TRL, the technology, technology readiness level of these applications into pre-operational level, TRL 7, increase significantly the number of users of each pilot, and then develop a sustainable, a sustainable business model for each one. So we want all these different applications to be integrated using common standardized approaches using, using standard interfaces uh, and to produce a, port, a, pro, a product portfolio addressing the monitoring needs defined in the geo priorities. So this is our objective. I'll pass it over to the different pilots to present their own uh, uh, developments within this first year. Elias, I think you're the, the first. Yes, good morning. And I will share my screen. <clears throat> if you can give me a thumbs up, that you can see my screen. I guess you can. Yes, I can see myself. <laughs> <laughs> nice and uh, this is a full screen mode okay, so good now, morning good morning yes now I thank you properly, yeah. great thanks so good morning everyone um i will talk about the 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 pilot number one of this uh, the fifth showcase within eShape that aims to improve the hydrological water availability and quality information as a service that something runs at SMHI. So for those that do not know me, my name is Ilias Petrivanidis. I'm a senior researcher at SMHI and I'm leading the efforts for this project, but there are many people behind that. Uh, some key personnel are Jude Musuza, 
from the group and David Gustafsson also. So let me bring you to, to a background. I presented that last year as well, but it's good to refresh the memory. So the objective um, is to come up with a higher TRL service uh, to the existing one and also to uh, improve the network of our users for an operational service uh, that aims to improve the historical information when it comes to um, water quantity and water quality around different domains. And um, we have services that operate over Europe, over the globe and over Sweden uh, as the national service. And, um, and yes, and we have a number of users uh, behind us, uh, which is the um, Swedish Agency for Marine and, and Water Management and also the Swedish Geological Survey for this particular project. But as I mentioned earlier, we just want to, ex to exploit uh, these services to other user communities. So the, the, the point is that when we are setting up a hydrological model to provide such historical information, is that we are, again, based on Earth observation data for land use and soil information. And then we are setting up the hydrological model structure that exists over this uh, large scale uh, large scales but the usually traditionally we are we are optimizing the model towards um, discharge stations in situ stations and the problem is that uh, these uh, these data are not available all over the world you can see here that there are regions over the globe that uh, these type of stations are not available to us as, as open data meaning that we cannot optimize the model uh, but nevertheless Nevertheless, nowadays uh, we have a lot of other information from, from Earth observations. So we are putting Earth observation data within the, the, the stepwise approach for calibrating the model parameters. And this allows us to better represent reality as reality is represented from the Earth observations. And uh, hence, hence we are producing a service which is more reliable and we can communicate to the users that different variables of interest are now better represented, are more reliable. This is an example here of the uh, potential evapotranspiration product that is that it comes from, from MODIS. And this is one of the products that we are uh, using in our service to, to improve reliability of, of our model. The, the service itself is actually existing now in the SMHI's uh, website. It's under hypeweb.smhi.se and, and uh, it provides historical data as long-term means or, or also as time series for different domains uh, over the globe, like for Europe, Arctic, Niger. But as I said earlier, the, the objective is also to introduce uh, the model that is that is set up for the whole globe. And uh, what we have been doing with Inishape is to collect a number of different uh, Earth observation products from different providers. And uh, the variables that, that they are interesting from a hydrological viewpoint is, is are related to, to snow, to soil moisture, to evapotranspiration, and uh, also some other in-situ data that has to do with water levels, uh, river discharge, and so on. So you can see here um, the, the data that we currently have in-house from the different providers, the, the special coverage, the resolution, the temporary resolution, and if these things are static or operational products and, and, the, and the period that the data are available. And it has been, quite a lot of effort being put on this task because a lot of things when it comes to model evaluation depends on this data. The, the other thing we, we did with Inishape is to set up a, a protocol for model evaluation, meaning that uh, now there's a methodology very transparent to all the users or to the scientific community uh, of of uh, how the model the models that we have are going to be evaluated against which products which performance metrics will be used and how the results the outcome will be visualized and by following such a protocol it allows also repeatability of these uh, model model evaluations meaning that 
if there is another set of data coming to us, we can repeat the model evaluation following the protocol and we can have comparable results to the things that we have already been doing. And this is a couple of examples of what we have been doing so far. So this is a comparison we did with the, with the European model, hydrological model that we have against the MODIS product, the actual evapotranspiration MODIS product. And we have been analyzing the results of the model versus the Earth observations when it comes to volumetric errors, errors uh, or performances to, to timing, so correlation coefficient, and also the um, annual eternal variability. And these are some, some ways of actually representing of how good the model is performing um, overall the, the domain of interest. This is the model performance when we are focusing on the, uh, on the discharge. The areas that they are depicted here as blue, this is when we have good model performance. And in the areas that we have um, um, red colors, this is when the model is not performing well, meaning that something is not well represented within the model and hence there is space for improvement. And this improvement will come by uh, additional model evaluations towards other Earth observation data and refinement of the model structure and refinement of the model parameters too. The last uh, slide I have here is one um, a, a evaluation we did over the, the global domain. This is in the first column, you have the simulated, the, the model outputs when it comes to potential evaporation, actual evaporation, fractional snow cover, snow water equivalent, soil moisture and, and changes in the water storage. And this is the model outputs and this is what we are, have been observing from Earth observation products. And uh, they come from different providers. Uh, that is the case. It's not that the provider is the same for all these different data sets. And in that column here, you can see the actual difference between the observed and the simulated. So whatever is, is coming with light red or light blue, that means we are, we are performing quite well, or the model is, is similar to what the observations are telling us. And when we go to more dense colors, red or blue, that means that there is discrepancy between the two uh, providers, the model or the Earth observations, and something needs to be done for getting uh, uh, these, these two uh, data closer to each other. And with that, I would like to thank you. And if there are questions, I can take the questions. So and we I can hope think, I'm in uh, long time. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> uh, we can take uh, one question uh, if, it is, if anyone wants to, to ask something at this point. Paniatis, uh, people, all, everyone in the session is able to talk. Uh, or yes, if they are. are they, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, everyone can uh, unmute themselves by themselves. Yes. Okay. okay. So if there are no questions, we'll follow to the second pilot. Uh, well, uh, if, somebody, if somebody wants to ask a question and uh, he's trying to, maybe it's among the people that are muted. If you all can hear me, you need to unmute your microphones first if you want to ask something because most of you are muted. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Panatis. Uh, we'll go to the second pilot, uh, and I'll ask uh, you to, to present. Not you, you, <laughs> you, uh, the, the first <laughs> Hi, you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, I think I my screen now. Huh? Uh, can you see my screen? We can. Yes. You can see it now. Okay. Okay. See how we start. Uh, hello, okay. everyone. Uh, Good now. Great. We cannot hear you very well. You. You can. Okay. Uh, lights back. Uh, 
a bit better. Sometimes it, it breaks. So if you can take out the video just to see if it really improves. Uh, try to get it. Oh, that's better. Or the, the presentation, the, 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 image, the image is good. The sound is not very good. If you can take out the video just to see if it improves your video feed. Can you try I'll sharing again? Uh, just, yeah. Share again and then. Okay, I close my video and then. Okay, now it's better, much better. Go ahead. Okay, 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 perfect. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vini. Of course, today Patrick is on vacations. So I'm here on behalf of our project team at NIST to give this presentation about Panel 2. The Panel 2 is standard Earth observation derived water bodies and flat water record over Europe. So for the objectives, the First, we would like to generate a water body and flood water record over Europe at 20 meters spatial resolution based on Sentinel 1 archive and to further understand flood hazards at continental scale based on Earth observation derived flood maps and hydrological modeling simulations, as well as to support different applications and research activities of the Global Flood Management Partnership community. And these are mainly called on the BGFP community. And we have several partners, such as Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute and Demos. For the key users, uh, it includes such as emergency responders, water agencies, uh, disaster risk finance industry, etc. Now, let me give a brief introduction of our methodology. Our flood mapping method is basically based on modeling the distribution of water and groundwater, as well as changed and unchanged components. And, uh, however, over a very large area, the flood extent may only occupy a very small fraction of the entire star imaging, such as uh, thus the distribution of the whole image only has a single modality, which is hardly clusterable. To deal with this problem, we use the hierarchical split-based approach, the HSBA for short, to extract such tail which has dual modality distribution in both flat image and the change image between flat and lab flat images. And this procedure is employed, implemented at uh, hierarchical levels. After extracting all of these image tails, the distribution of the union of these image tails has dual modality. And then we can estimate the parameters of distributions of water and then water, as well as changed and unchanged components for further image processing, such as the region growing basis image segmentation, as we use in our case. So for the products, uh, as we aim to generate flat records over Europe based on the whole Sentinel-1 archive. We work with very known time series data. Based on the whole time series, we can extract permanent water body and an exclusion layer. The exclusion layer includes dense forests and built up area, in which area the Sentinel-1 intensity data cannot provide useful or reliable information for flood detection. And then the HSB change detection was applied on the successive image pile to generate a flat map stack as well as a flat probability stack. These four products are corresponding to our baseline product based on a feasibility report issued by the Joint Research Center at the beginning of this year. And on basis on the basis of the flat map stack some additional maps can be further extracted, such as flat frequency, flat maximum extent over a time period, or we can track flat evolution over a given time period. Currently, we would like to share a case study of monsoon related flooding in Myanmar with the GFP community. We choose this case as it has very long-term duration, large flood events 
which could be very informative to different users so that we can connect a feedback, valuable feedback from them. And the users can get access to our results in Google Earth Engine app through this link. So in this Earth Engine app, users can select uh, different layers to visualize the different products as I mentioned earlier, and compare different layers step by side, for instance, to check the variation of flat extent uh, between different timestamps, or to visualize the Battery flood map and the corresponding flood probability. Uh, different uh, maps might be useful for different applications and users. For instance, the battery flood map can be useful for estimation of affected population and uh, infrastructure, whereas the flood probability can be used as an input of hydrological modeling. We would like to ask for feedback from users about what kind of other information or maps might be helpful for them or they are interested in, so we can update our products accordingly. Now, this is my last slide. For next steps, the first thing is to present our current results to the GFB community and then to refine and update the products and the tasks according to the newly defined needs from users. In addition, we would also like to outreach to some new user communities, such as the European Association of Remote Sensing Company community, as well as some market analysis by external consultants. For instance, to adapt our hazard tool to monitor urban sprawl. And the last point is that we are, still, we are still trying to figure out a suitable solution regarding the DS implementation to scale up our current products to the whole European continent. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Pilot 2? I have a, a short question, you. Uh, so th that Google Earth Engine instance that you were showing, is it uh, open for everyone to take a look or is it internal to you, to, to the pilot? Yeah, it's, it's open, I think it's open. It's open to everyone, it's open source. So it's, in, yeah. it's in the slide. Can you, can you put, but can you put it in the chat? Just can you uh, share that link in the chat, in the okay. chat in the, so that people can, uh, Browse if they want okay, to. Okay, no, no, no problem. I will, I will put in the chat. Put the Thank you very chat. much. You're so okay. I'll pass it over to the third pilot, uh, handled by PML, and uh, Pete will be presenting. Hi, Pete. Hello. I should just share my screen. Hello again. Can everybody see see that? Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah, I can, yeah, I can great. Fine. Okay, well, uh, well, my name is Peter Walker, and I work at PML, and we're, we're presenting the, the dive application, which is part of the coastal water visibility um, area, and I'm working on this with Darren and Simeon. So Darren is doing the mobile application, and Simeon is doing the back-end processing, so it's a, a very much a collaborative effort here. So a bit of background on PML. Um, we're a scientific institution. Uh, we've been around for quite a long time, 40 years or more, and our main business is peer reviewed publications with very high impact uh, in various ways, not just scientific, uh, you know, scientific reviews, but uh, digital media and things like that. And we work in the center for geospatial applications, uh, which develops GIS tools, web apps, and those are used by 15 or so global EU projects. So web applications is something we've been doing for maybe 10, 15 years now. Um, but they're very much aimed at scientific 
community. We we process data as part of Copernicus, um, and we're involved in the uh, Ocean Colour CCI project, all of which are, are very much scientific data sets that are, are being produced. Uh, PML is also a hands-on organisation, got people working in the lab and going out on boats collecting samples. So we're, we're very much crossing a lot of a lot of disciplines. So that's that's a little bit of background on PML and where, where we're developing it from. You might have noticed I haven't mentioned mobile applications as something that we, we really do as, as something. So this is new for us. So why why dive? Well, as part of the work we've been doing, we're involved in web portals, etc. And we, we we exist in this realm of scientific data. But we see a huge amount of data being produced, particularly at the moment with Copernicus and Sentinel um, instruments, uh, masses of data. And it, even for a scientist, it's very hard to, to keep on top of all of this. There's lots of data portals around. We've developed a number of them. The one in the illustration here is uh, actually the, the C members portal, which we didn't develop, but it's actually a pretty good portal. And it's a, it's a good example of, of what you'd have to do if you were trying to get the, the information that we're going to produce in dive uh, using the more traditional methods. So first of all, you know, you, you need to find your data portal. You need here, we've, we've now selected a point, we've clicked on it, we've, we've got some information. But it's not easy to read at a glance, particularly if you're not a scientist and understanding what the various palettes mean, etc. So within eShape, we've identified what we think is needed. So we're going to take all those data sets, which are pretty much sourced out of Copernicus, and we're going to synthesize those into a, a simple uh, visibility score for the, for the dive area that the, the, um, the diver is interested in. Um, and then the, the diver can use that just to, to plan their day's diving or decide whether to go or not. And the information will just be presented on a, a simple mobile phone application. They choose their dive site and then they get a, a very simple summary of the conditions for that site. So if you compare the, the, the two, two screens, you can see it's much easier just to, to pull the information out of that, that sort of simple application. It's very much aimed at the non-scientific user who just wants to get information for their particular area of, of interest. So how does it work? Um, basically, we, in the last period of the project, have been uh, working on the, the back end selection. And we've decided to go with the as we selected the CreoDS platform uh, to run all of the back end processing. Now, the advantages of the using a DS is that the information that we need is actually provided uh, within the system. So we can actually pull the uh, CMEMS data directly out of the DS without making any uh, additional calls or anything. It's all handled um, for us automatically. For an organization like PML, that's not necessarily a big deal because we actually produce a lot of the CMEMS data anyway. But if we wanted to, to scale to other data sets that PML didn't directly access, then it, that could be a major, major factor in growing the, the product in the future. It's also got benefits for scalability. If, if we need to do more processing, then we can just move to a bigger VM and uh, increase our capacity that way without actually having to buy more hardware um, at the PML data center, which is actually getting pretty full at the moment anyway. And at the moment, we're actually finding it's actually a more efficient way to process because we don't actually need to run the back end 24 hours a day because the CMEMS data comes on a daily basis. So we just need to fire up the, the back end, process the data and um, store it ready for the, for the middleware to use. So we actually only need to run the, the processing system for a few hours a day, which is good for the environment. So Basically, what happens is that the, the dive processing is instantiated on the, on the VM, pulls the data from CMEMS and assembles visibility scores for all the sites that we've identified that, that are of interest. Once it's done that, it pushes those out to the, um, the dive server itself, which we do host at PML. Um, we provide a lot of web applications already and we, we just find it easy, at least at the development phase, to, to host it locally. So all, all the data is uploaded to the, the dive database um, and we provide an open dive API, which will both allow a list of sites, which is useful for the back end processing, uh, but it's also the, the way that the, uh, the front end application, the, the mobile app will communicate. So this is an open API. Uh, you can 
go and query the, uh, the various uh, operations it can carry out. And other people could plug, plug applications into that if, if they wished. So the data is then stored at, um, within our, our system there. And, and finally, it becomes available to the diver on their mobile phone. So they just click on that, makes a call to the API, and hopefully they, they get the information that they, they require and they can go on their dive or, or decide it's probably not a good way to go diving. In the future, we're looking at having that arrow probably is showing as two headed there because we'd like the divers to be able to push back information. So when they go to a dive site, they can provide information on the visibility they, they see. That can then get fed back into the dive API and then we can actually push it all the way back down the chain and, and use it to validate both our model and to even go back and, and help the people who are developing the, uh, the scientific um, uh, uh, data sets in, in the first place. So there is an element of uh, citizen science going on there. So I think uh, I'm just about running out of time here. So, uh, so thank you. And if there are any questions, then please um, let me know. Uh, thanks, Pete. So, any questions on Pilot Three? <clears throat> let me uh, let me remind again to everyone who can hear me that if you have questions, you need to unmute your microphone if you're trying to ask a question. Uh, I see now either that you're that at least there's activity in your mic, but we cannot hear you either. I don't know if you're uh, trying to speak. No, no, no. Just ah, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Then. Um, okay, so I will pass it over to uh, pilot four, uh, Lucas. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm going to share the screen. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. good morning. So my my name is uh, is Mark Lucas. I work at CLS, which is um, a, a company based in Toulouse, uh, and I work with. Um, Marion Satan, who's actually the lead on the uh, sargassum detection for seasonal planning, uh, which is uh, the pilot for uh, for this uh, uh, water uh, resources management. Um, so just to give you a bit of context, uh, there's been a, a huge sargassum uh, strandings uh, in the wide Atlantic region since uh, 2011. And these strandings have been affecting marine, uh, the marine environment, human health, tourism, fishing and agriculture. CLS has been operating uh, SAM tool, which is a, a sargassum monitoring tool for operational planning, so uh, short, short scale kind of forecasts since 2018. Uh, this uh, SAM tool, this monitoring tool, uh, has the following uh, elements. So first of all, uh, satellite detection through the use of uh, data from Sentinel-3, Sentinel-2, uh, NOAA Aqua and uh, Landsat-8. Uh, uh, Drift uh, forecast uh, element, uh, which is um, which uses the uh, CLS develop, uh, model called Mobi Drift, and uh, it has also a, a visualization and um, interface, web interface for users to be able to visualize the detections and the drift results. Uh, currently, uh, this uh, monitoring tool is um, run on the CLS own infrastructure. And the current users uh, include uh, the French government, Meteor France, environmental agencies, national parks, and private companies spread out through, uh, throughout the, the wider uh, Caribbean. Um, the, use back, you, uh, the feedback we've, we've been getting from the users we've been interacting is that what they really need, what they were really looking for, is some form of seasonal uh, planning, seasonal forecasting of the um, uh, Sargassum uh, uh, stranding. And so uh, this is uh, a need uh, that we've been trying to answer through uh, the eShape pilot. Uh, and so the and we can be, and we've been doing this through the following steps. So first of all, we've been uh, improving the seasonal fogasm detection uh, by uh, adding a synthetic aperture radar um, data, uh, which has uh, the the big advantage of not being affected by clouds, which are uh, fairly frequent over the Caribbean region. 
Uh, we've also been working on providing a, a long-term drift simulations. So instead of just having the five-day forecast, uh, working on providing people with three months uh, uh, of forecast so that they can plan ahead. And also uh, working to uh, extend the user community and provide some form of generic support uh, to facilitate the decision-making processes. Uh, in terms of uh, the added value of the uh, of the eShape uh, um, program, uh, for first of all, uh, through eShape we have easy access to Earth observation data. So uh, Sentinel three for the uh, optical and Sentinel one for the SAR data. Uh, using the GIAS infrastructure. Uh, we've also, we haven't done it yet, but we, we want to use uh, the cloud computing for uh, capacities uh, in order to uh, be able to do uh, a, a SOGASM uh, detection reanalysis, so a year-long uh, reanalysis, uh, which is uh, very uh, CPU intensive. And also, um, uh, on, on a regular basis, perform uh, the large-scale drift simulation. So these are like the seasonal, uh, drift simulations, which will enable us to uh, give uh, the authorities uh, advance warning of what's coming their way. And then finally, uh, we're looking uh, to uh, leverage uh, the eShape uh, Partners Network uh, to uh, work on the co-design and the sustainability. Uh, so far, uh, what we've been, uh, what we've achieved uh, in terms of the shape pilot. So first of all, we've adapted the Sargassum test and changed for the analysis configuration. So uh, this is this is to get a, a year-long reanalysis, which is a kind of a, a the, the building uh, uh, the base on which we will build, build our seasonal forecast. So this has been done through the dockerization and the scalability using Kubernetes of the processing chain to allow the computation of the uh, one-year reanalysis using Sentinel-3 data. We have also in parallel been improving uh, the detection uh, algorithm that is based on, uh, that uses, sorry, the OLC Sentinel-3 data. And uh, we also, um, uh, we've been, well, we've had some progress in terms of developing uh, uh, an Earth observation service uh, with and for the users. So we have an ongoing discussion with the CERMES, which is the department of the University of West Indies, uh, based in Barbados, which is uh, handling the uh, sargassum uh, for the local authorities. And so we are working with them to um, support uh, their sargassum outlook bulletins. Uh, through uh, data and information provided by uh, uh, by the eShape e pilot. So that's the, the first uh, first results. And in terms of what's uh, coming next, uh, well, uh, at the end of, this, of the first sprint, uh, we uh, intend to have uh, the uh, sargassum detection chain uh, deployed on the selected uh, DS infrastructure. And uh, we want to compute and make available uh, the one-year reanalysis of sargassum detection uh, based on all C Sentinel-3 data. Uh, at the beginning of, for the second sprint, uh, we'll be working on um, uh, using the Sentinel uh, synthetic aperture radar data for sargassum detection. Uh, further work on the segmentation component in order to uh, dockerize and deploy uh, the chain on um, the, the processing chain, sorry, on uh, uh, a DIAS infrastructure. Uh, we also want to link with next year's, uh, with the next year's results and deploy the full chain on the um, uh, suitable uh, infrastructure. Run the seasonal drift simulations. So these are, again, they are like, you know, the three month long simulations to give advance warning of what's coming uh, towards uh, the uh, Caribbean region and uh, work on uh, bringing more users, user, users in so you know, uh, 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 broaden the uh, uh, the users, and that's uh, an overview of what we've been, do we've been doing in this in this uh, e-shaped pilot. And I'm happy to take your questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, any questions for pilot four? Again, let me remind you all that your mics are muted. You need to unmute them first if you want to ask a question. Okay, thank you, Panatis. Uh, so we go to pilot five. We finished this uh, first round of presentations and we'll start the discussion and the different po uh, uh, points for discussion uh, among ourselves. So Ida, can you present pilot five, please? Yes, sure. No.
Can you see my screen? Yep. yep. Yes. All good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm Ida Kampus. Uh, I work uh, in IPMA, the Portuguese Institute for the Sea and Atmosphere, and I'm a fisheries biologist. Uh, IPMA is uh, coordinating this pilot together with DEMUS. So here you can see uh, what are the persons that are uh, at the moment collaborating in this pilot. So what is the interest in uh, monitoring uh, fishing activity? Uh, fishing is considered the most important uh, human activity in deep sea marine areas. Uh, and there is a special uh, concern on the impact of fisheries uh, on the species exploited and also uh, on the ecosystems. So uh, monitoring uh, the fishing activity uh, is essential for scientific advice. Uh, that leads to the definition of management, uh, management measures. And these measures are in line with EU uh, policies such as the Common Fisheries Policy and the Marine Strategy uh, Framework Directive. Uh, the aim of uh, this pilot is uh, to develop uh, a web-based tool that uh, provides a set of functionalities uh, including exploration and visualization of spatial uh, fisheries uh, data. So this tool uh, will uh, provide maps on fishing intensity and also on environmental characterization for the deep sea uh, fishing areas in the Northeast Atlantic, comprising the Portuguese EZ, but also the extended uh, shelf. Uh, and these results are to be provided to the fisheries administration, fisheries uh, researchers, the fishing industry, and the society uh, in general. The activity uh, of the fleets operating in this area was uh, analyzed based on AIS positioning data from fishing vessels, and also on fleet characteristics, fishing licenses, and sales Providing, uh, provided by the Portuguese Directorate of Natural uh, Resources, which is the organism in charge of fisheries administration in Portugal. The AIS uh, system is a, a system designed for uh, safety purposes that provides uh, uh, positional data from fishing vessels at sea. Uh, this system uh, is uh, free or, uh, well, the data can be uh, acquired uh, by anyone. Uh, in this case, they, they were provided by marine traffic. Uh, and this system, together with the, the vessel monitoring system, uh, generates a large amount of data that uh, uh, are of interest. Although they are for safety or control purposes, they, uh, they have a lot of interest uh, and are very useful for, um, for uh, uh, research. So I will talk a little bit uh, briefly about uh, the products that, uh, that were uh, uh, developed. Uh, in this pilot, we started by identifying the different fisheries taking place in the area uh, in study, and then uh, characterize the spatial uh, patterns of the vessels engaged in these fisheries. What are these fisheries? These fisheries are fisheries that are um, capturing uh, big pelagic fish, uh, and they are the uh, long line fishing and the pole and line fishing. I will talk a, a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you, if you, you maybe you, you are not familiar with, with this, so I will uh, talk a bit about. Um, our uh, first product uh, are maps. Uh, this is still in development. Uh, but uh, we have uh, achieved some interesting results uh, and our first product is maps uh, of uh, fishing trips. Uh, each trip, you can see uh, in the left side, each trip is a vessel a trajectory starting in a fishing port and ending at the same port or in a, a different port. And the spatial points of this trajectory uh, can form patterns uh, and from these patterns, it is uh, possible if the data have enough quality or uh, to identify uh, fishing activity 
and separate fishing from non-fishing points, which, which is cr crucial for uh, the progress of, of this uh, work and development of the products we want to develop. Here you can see the fishing trip and uh, um, you can see the, the points, white points corresponding to navigation point and points and then the concentration of, of points uh, which indicate fishing activity. And this is a long line, a, a long line fishing trip. You can see here the type of vessels that are operating in these areas. Um, an example from a, a source. Um, we, we are still uh, working on the methodologies uh, uh, to separate fishing from non-fishing points. This is a, a very challenging uh, job. And you can, hear, you, can, you can see here the example uh, of uh, analysis of the different descriptors associated to these points. These points are characterized by uh, uh, speed uh, and uh, a course, and of course the, the, the position. And the, the, the joint, the combined analysis of these descriptors can uh, give us clues about if they are or, or not fishing points. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the separation uh, from, uh, of fishing from non-fishing points uh, is crucial, as I said, and allow us to uh, estimate uh, maps of uh, fishing pressures. Uh, we have called it the fishing footprint, and you have here an example for the Poland line uh, uh, fishes. This is another type of fishery you can see in the bottom left uh, screen the type of fishery to uh, where tuna, different species of tuna are target. Uh, and here you have the map of the fishing um, uh, footprint. Uh, this is produced by displaying the points, uh, the, fish, the fishing points in a grid, in this case where the special, uh, special re resolution was uh, 0 0.1 uh, degree. And finally, um, and, and this is in the Astoros archipelago, as, as you can see uh, here. The fishing around the, the, the Astoros. And our third product uh, is fishing uh, sales of targeted uh, species by port. Um, you can see, uh, you can see here. Okay, uh, what is the current uh, uh, status? Uh, these products are still being developed and, uh, and the methodologies uh, are being worked. Uh, and uh, uh, they will be available to the key users via a geo portal. Um, and uh, uh, this geo portal avail is available in the next uh, geos uh, infrastructures. What are our key users? Uh, well, the Portuguese Fisheries Administration is the main user of this, or one of the main users. Uh, the scientific community, fishing industry, NGOs, international organization, and the, the public in general, the citizens. Uh, we are now at the moment of defining the user uh, requirements uh, for these products and trying to um, uh, meet with uh, with key users. Uh, we still have um, many challenges to overcome, and one of them is uh, to get uh, some data uh, that would very much improve uh, the quality of our products, such as the fishing logbooks, uh, which describe fishing operations. And we are in the process of. Uh, trying to get this data and, as I said, improving the, what we are developing. Well, and nothing more. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I will be happy to address any questions uh, together with Nuno, which is the other coordinator of this uh, pilot. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Yes, thank you very much, Aida. Uh, this concludes the presentation uh, of the five different let me share my my video with you 
the five different pilots currently included in the water resources management. I want to provide some uh, 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 more space uh, for questions regarding this, this pilot. So I'll change a bit. The original uh, setup that we had for this um, for this session was that we'll, ha we'll talk about the milestones, inputs to other WPs. So a bit a bit a bit more internal discussion on 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 how the work will proceed on on this on this uh, showcase. I think the project management team did a very good job in summarizing that in the in the previous session. So I don't think we need to go over that again. And because I can, I'll change it <laughs> and. I'll focus now on on questions to the um, uh, to, to the pilots, the current pilots. I do want to present then after the new uh, uh, pilots. I hope that Arco and Daniela are present and can talk. For now, we, I'll, I'll open up the discussion and I hope that you all participate. That's the only way to make this a productive uh, session. Any questions to the different pilots that you saw currently in the in the uh, or, or in this session? Please unmute your mic and speak as you wish. <clears throat> okay, I see that uh, at least so far, no many not, not many questions uh, 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 about the the, the pilots. I wanted uh, Panayotis. Can so the, is there a chat? Capability here in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, room. No, no. Oh. Hi, yes, Francesca. Francesca. Hi, how Hi. are you? So I have a question actually to to one pilot to um, uh, to Peter from Pilot Three about the our information on visibility in Europe. If mm -hmm. I if I go back in time a little bit, we had this first discussion uh, with the showcase and um, uh, listening to all the pilot description. Uh, I. I I came to the, to the conclusion that for this pilot, uh, there were some terms in, in delays due to um, due to COVID and uh, uh, the way to interact with the different kind of uh, users communities. So I just wanted to see with Peter if this was sort of overcome or in the process, also because this was also part of a challenge and uh, in one of the support tickets uh, office from PMT. So I, I, I throw the questions to then uh, maybe catch up with our, um, be before discussion, let's say. Peter. Yeah, hi, I've just, just unmuted. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's still a challenge. Uh, we've, we've been very much sort of stuck in the, the office, not getting out very far um, over the last year. So uh, we're still trying to build up relationships. I think uh, also we, we found that our original um, target group had um, basically stopped so we're, we're trying to establish some contacts with the local um, diving organizations who have started up during the summer so uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we haven't really made much progress on that yet we, we hope to have something by the end of the year okay because uh, um th thanks for this uh, um from our side in terms of uh, of user uptake i was um, i'm working in cooperation with uh, vp2 in terms of co-design um, let's say to fine tune better our relations, our work relations, uh, to, to help the pilots in this. And for example, with you, um, I was started doing a job with our um, current taxonomy really to identify more user communities that could be interested to engage with and that could uh, eventually help. So if this could be a way, we might have, I don't know, maybe a, a meeting the two of us um, in the following weeks on this. Do you think this could be um, suitable for you? Yes, I think that, that sounds sounds like a good idea. Um, yes, yeah, so okay. we talk after after this meeting. Yes, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, okay. Pete. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Nuna, as well. Thanks, Francisca, for that uh, for that input. Um, any other questions? Uh, no, no. I I only have a a, a comment. It's not a question, it's more a comment, because the, 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 the pilots are so different between them. Uh, and the data that we are using are so, the, 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 the data sources are, are so different. Uh, uh, so I, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, see uh, close uh, relationships uh, between the, 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 the pilots. But uh, anyway, 
I, I would like to, to, to know uh, or to um, comment that this, um, all this um, data that we saw uh, will uh, contribute to the, to the, what it is called now the digital twin of the ocean uh, in, in Horizon Europe. Uh, mission, the mission oceans, one of the, 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 the aims uh, of the mission is to create, as, as far as I, as I understood, is to create a digital twin of the ocean. Uh, so uh, for a digital twin of the ocean, I think we need uh, real-time data on the, on, the, on the ocean and on the processes. Uh, is it, the, are these pilots giving uh, real-time data? Real-time uh, tools, this, these tools show what is um, happening. I, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to the different pilots. I don't know, I, I, Elias, so you're providing forecasts based on your model. So uh, how uh, uh, real time is the, 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 the outputs of your pilot? Yeah, I wouldn't call those forecasts, but it is more like operational data, meaning that um, every day the model is updated. So it's more like a monitoring status, uh, monitoring from the model perspective, from the model reality. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, uh, this information like uh, water quantity and quality from the different river systems that end up to the oceans, uh, then, then it becomes, uh, it fulfills what you actually mentioned. Um, so it goes there. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to comment uh, on the previous uh, remark that you made that we are using different Earth observations. And I think, uh, to me, it, it, this is not a problem. Uh, as, as long as we are, for our own services, we are using what we consider state-of-the-art Earth observations for the service of interest. So consistency doesn't need to, to be there be, between us, between the pilots. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree. I'll just see a uh, hype contributing to this initiative of the, of the digital twin. Have you thought about that? Like, uh, it, indeed, it is, it is It is becoming a trend. And uh, we saw it in the few week in, in, in ESA, um, the different the digital twin concept of uh, the ability to, pro to, to simulate the different processes occurring at different scales. I'm sure that hype is, can be an integral part of that. And uh, can you talk about a bit about it? Yeah, and I, I think since uh, we have this global model, uh, also in a case study within eShape, I think this is a good opportunity. It's more like we've been providing input to, to the oceanographers uh, as an output from the re different river systems. So I guess the oceanographers then we will do, then we'll do the digital twin of the oceans. But we, we try to do the digital twin of, of the soil and the and the earth. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think the, those different digital twins feed into the, this concept. So it's not only a digital twin of the ocean, you'll have also land processes that uh, are, are, are will go into the digital twin, in the, in the, their corresponding digital twin, indeed. Uh, yeah. You, do you have any comment on the IDAS uh, comment on the real-time data? So how, so when you're monitoring a flood activity occurring, um, how far, how fast can you provide info on that on that flood event? Okay, uh, because we rely on the Sentinel One data, so with uh -huh. Sentinel One A one and, and One being the temporary resolution is six days. So after after the after the data can absorb uh, any a certain flood event, so we can processing the data to get a result very uh, rapidly. In that, because our method is a uh, is uh, very e efficient uh, with for whole sun for whole central one image we can get a result in 10 minutes so that depends on the on the data if we can get the if the data can capture the event we can get the result in near real time i would say 
So, and, and if you tested it, in, uh, because, okay, you, you have the, the usual S1 uh, data hubs that are not providing data in, 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 in real-time conditions, but have you tested, in, yeah. test, tested it with the antennas that can provide you with, with faster links to the data or something, This a similar setup like this? Uh, no, I'm so, mm, not really. Okay. <laughs> not Nuno. really, but maybe Marco yeah. have some comments. Uh, Nuno, on Marco. Hi, Marco. Marco. So, Hi. Um, so the near real time, it means that uh, we have to wait. The data are provided to the DIAS, so, but this is up in a few hours. Ah, okay. So right now it's up to a few hours. Yeah, where you after a few hours, the acquisition via the, um, the collaborative or uh, DS, uh, we, we have data, and then we can process. But I want to add something. So the data, the, the, the revisit time uh, of the, the satellite with the same orbit is six days. But if we combine more orbits, ascending, descending, Usually the revisit time over, over an area in Europe is three days with Sentinel-1 in average. It means that we have in average a couple of images, uh, a couple of images per week. That this is not uh, a fixed uh, sampling. It can be after one day, after three days, but in average we have two images per week. Mm. And regarding that, uh, that uh, 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 the ability for you to process the data after those those uh, couple of hours that it takes to, to arrive to DS, and then the revisit time, are uh, in your conversation with the users, are they okay with this with this setup? Uh, are they satisfied with this? Do they, do they want to improve this on this? Do you know? But uh, we had the discussion because we have over operational project in Southeast Asia where we have um, a long. Uh, uh, so we have the, during the monsoon season we have floods that lost uh, weeks. So with this revisit time, because there we tested also the full capacity of Sentinel One in some area, uh, they are uh, they are quite happy. But uh, of course we can improve this. So this is can be improved. But the algorithm can work also uh, uh, with other data, like any any kind of uh, radar data. It can provide data in results in the same way. So we also integrate, for example, their data from RadarSat2 to increase the revisit time, especially in the um, receding phase of the flood. And uh, basically, we didn't uh, add much. But this is for the monsoon. Of course, for flash, fl uh, flash floods or um, floods, uh, smaller, I mean, to have uh, an higher revisit time, it, it, it would be better. But uh, we will experience this uh, uh, probably in some test case uh, outside of Europe uh, uh, using also new radar sub constellation. Then this is can help us to improve the, the revisit. Uh, Thanks, Mark, Marco. Um, so I, uh, pilot three, Pete, the, the, the real time data, is it a, a, since you're providing um, diving conditions to divers? Uh, I'm, I'm supposing that this needs to be real-time data that they can work with uh, on whenever they decide to do a, a dive, a, 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 a diving expedition, let's say. Yeah, but the, the aim is we produce a daily update. Um, the data that we use, well, the, the CMEMS data is Sentinel-3 Ultras, the prime source in that generally is a, it's a daily product. Um, because it's ocean color, we also have the limits of the uh, cloud cover and things so we cannot guarantee that we'll get information of the day but the, the processing setup is that it's, it's produced with it, it um, assimilates all of the, the different data sources on a daily basis and produces a, a single uh, shot for the day I don't think we can probably go any more near real time than that uh, but it's very dependent mm. on, on data being available and the feedback that you got from users, are they able to plan or to decide any, uh, something based on the, on the input that you provide at the time that you provide it? Well, at, at the moment, as we had in our previous um, conversation with Francesca, we've, we've not really had a lot of feedback back okay. at the moment, so we need to get on, on to that. Okay, uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, uh, Lucas, no, Mark, sorry. Yes, uh, hi, yeah. Uh, I, just, uh, just first of all, to start with... Um, 
my, my understanding of the of the digital twin ocean is basically um, uh, combining uh, uh, in situ observations, uh, satellite observations, and model data. Um, because basically, the, the the way things are set up currently, uh, if you want to have a continuous uh, real time data, you have to rely on in situ instruments. But they only give you like usually like you know. A, a limited uh, spatial range uh, information. Uh, similarly, um, if you want to have like you know a large uh, spatial information, you have to use a satellite. But they, you know, there's a, a kind of um, the, the update frequency is often you know a couple of days or if not more. Uh, and uh, and so the only way to actually have a kind of a, an instantaneous uh, view of the ocean is to use model. And so my understanding of the digital digital twin ocean is that you kind of you assimilate or you input all the observational data into to initiate uh, or to update uh, your model in order to be able to have a, a kind of a, a, a real time view of what's a real time modelized view of what's happening in the ocean, uh, and then you know some forecastability for a couple of uh, for a couple of days. So for me, this is how I understand the digital twin ocean, um, and uh, so with. Regard to the specific questions of how we are doing this uh, in our in our in our pilot uh, to kind of uh, estimate or to uh, forecast the drift of the mass, so to have a kind of a an up to date uh, and also uh, in the near future view of where the mats are. Um, and I guess you know when when we're talking, uh, so coming back to the kind of you know. Um, a global vision of the digital twin ocean. I guess what we don't have is um, in situ data, so we don't, um, we haven't yet managed to get, um, uh, if you like, um, uh, in real time and also observations of sarg sargassum mats from users. And this is something that I think is uh, particularly interesting uh, because we need this. Uh, Obviously, to kind of improve the service and validate some of our detections, and so ultimately, what we would like to do is, if we have uh, users such as um, uh, f fishermen who go out and spot a mat, you know, they're reported back to us, and that can help us validate. But uh, the, uh, I guess, in in those type of systems, particularly the type of systems which are we're still at the phase where we're trying to engage with the user community we don't yet have this uh, feedback loop to um uh to 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 us from the user so uh, slightly similar to what was um proposed by pml saying that basically you know eventually they would like their app to be used uh, by the uh, the divers to kind of um report on the uh, the visit well, the, 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 the the visibility and then that kind of feeds back into their system and i guess that's uh, where i see a, 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 well i think it's a, it's one of the biggest challenges i think uh to um for for all these type of systems is getting the is getting the the, the users feedback and uh, and and using that uh, the information they can provide to improve the system I, and i think also just to uh, i'll finish on this but i think what's also in interesting is that um when users uh, are able to 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 give feedback they usually become more implicated uh, you know, and everybody likes to <laughs> give their opinion and you know being able to um, uh, provide information to the system that helps you, makes you want to use it more, or encourages you to use it more. So maybe it's a, so I think it's a very important aspect that we need to work upon. Yeah, indeed. And um, with all these different um, uh, apps, it's all about reaching that critical mass where you can, where where users are, uh, are, are happy enough with the product that they'll use it. And by using it, they'll provide feedback, and that feeds back into the. So that critical mass of, of users is what's usually that, that, uh, important and very hard to get. And uh, yeah, yeah, both for you and uh, and for and for PML, that would be a critical issue on, on the development of your of your products. Yeah, yeah I very much agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so I, either do you want to complement that on on pilot five? <laughs> Regarding uh, pilot five. Uh, I, I see that maybe in, in the future <laughs> we, we can have real-time data. One possibility is the fishermen uh, being engaged with uh, providing uh, real-time data on their activities. Uh, they have the means to do that. Uh, fishermen have... Uh, there is a, a system dedicated to, to 
a positioning system uh, and surveillance system dedicated to fisheries, which is the vessel monitoring uh, uh, system, VMS. And uh, by um, this is installed in, uh, in all the fishing vessels uh, with the length uh, uh, higher than 15 meters or 12 meters, depending on the cases. And, uh, and this registers uh, positions at sea. And also, uh, it has the, the capacity to, to register um, uh, the, the fishing events. And uh, fishermen can also add uh, what they are really fishing in each fishing event. And if we could have the, this data in real time, and it is not so difficult because it's stored in the, in the blue box in the, in, the, in the system on board, and uh, it could be easily downloaded uh, at, uh, at arrival to port. There is no reason uh, for that not happening. And uh, if, if fishermen uh, um, uh, were uh, willing to uh, participate with this data, that would be an enormous uh, advantage uh, for uh, research and for uh, fisheries management. So that's, that's how I see that uh, we could have not, uh, maybe not real time data, but uh, near real time. <laughs> Can I can I ask you a follow up question? I, I I I so I'm kind of doing the questions that we've been doing internally for for, for, for some time now. But uh, um, the the main issue there is with the privacy issues and and to the fishermen to be um, willing to share that data. That's data that for them it's kind of like their business intelligence. Do you see a way to motivate them to to do so? Because indeed that would be a, a, the main bottleneck, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are confidentiality uh, data. Uh, this data are uh, emitted uh, via satellite to a, a station on Earth, a control station, uh, a DGRM control station. Um, but they are emitted with the intervals uh, of two to two hours. Uh, so this is a very uh, bad quality to estimate uh, and map uh, fishing activity in a detailed manner. Uh, but this data um, can be recorded uh, in the blue box. And by being recorded, they can be downloaded at arrival to port, as I said. Um, well, these are, these of course, uh, are confidential data, the data of positioning uh, fishing vessels. Uh, they are confidential, but at the same time, they are not because we have uh, the AIS system, which is a global system, not for the purpose of control, but for the purpose of safety on sea. And, uh, and these are the data that we have used in our analysis. And uh, the A in the AIS data, uh, confidentiality is lost because the vessels can be identified. Uh, so uh, we we can see uh, we can see what is the real activity of the fishing vessels at sea. Uh, so there is there is no more uh, there is there is still a, a, a confidential issue, but not so strong anymore from the, the point uh, that we have now another system designed for other purpose that is giving the exact location and more the identification and the characteristics of the best. So this is a relative uh, uh, problem. <laughs> can I? Okay, can I, I, I so. Yeah, sure, sure, Mark. Go yeah. ahead. Can I just? I thought um, there's there's two two things I want to to say on uh, to follow up. Uh, first of all, I, I thought that it was only a certain um, uh, size of vessel which has IS. I, I can't remember, but I think it's something like a 300 gross tonnage, uh, which means that you know s uh, smaller vessels uh, which uh, are don't aren't monitored by AIS. And what I've read uh, and seen is that in other parts of the world, 
uh, when fishing vessels don't want to be monitored, they switch off their IS. And so, and I, there was there's some some people working on the at CLS anyway, working on com combining AIS data with uh, SAR data because with the SAR data you can see the signature of a of a vessel, and it allows you to see in a in a fishing zone which uh, uh, vessels are. Uh, you, have their AIS switched on and, and what other vessels are around which have switched off their AIS in order to try and, you know, be uh, undetected. And I think, uh, um, so I guess, you know, this issue of, um, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's obviously difficult for the, for the fishermen because they have a lot of, you know, they have a lot of economic pressure and, you know, and they, they want to bring back the catches and, and obviously, you know, the legislation and the, all the monitoring is kind of, uh, well, I don't know. I think there's a lot of um, uh, capacity, you know, awareness raising amongst the, the, the fishermen community that is needed in order for them to buy in this type of service, probably, and not feel that they're just being policed by uh, people very far away who don't care about their livelihood. Indeed, indeed, that, that's the main the main issue there, and it's a, a very interesting one that we're exploring in Pilot Five. We had already sessions with WP2 to try to overcome that, to bring that into the co-design, and how can we deal with it, with with that confidentiality, and how can we make the different stakeholders at ease with that? I'm sorry to to have the, the conversation is interesting, and I'm sure that we could go on. I want to have some time for the new pilots, and I don't know if Arco and Daniela are present. Daniela, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. So maybe you can share your. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. So maybe you can talk. You already presented in the, in a previous session um, the, an overview of your pilot. If you can give like, give us a one or two minute uh, uh, overview of that and uh, and uh, talk whatever you want about uh, about the pilot. Yes, thank you, Nuno. Uh, I'm not sure that you called me also some minutes ago, but uh, I had some problem with not. connection. Ah, okay, perfect. So because <laughs> I, it's, uh, I, I hear my name, but uh, maybe it's not uh, correct. Anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be part uh, of uh, your your team uh, of this uh, showcase. And uh, um, yesterday, yes, uh, you're right. Yesterday, I had the chance to introduce, uh, to have just some minutes to introduce and to talk something about to explain something about uh, the, this new pilot in, this, in a specific session. Anyway, um, our pilot, this pilot will be focused on the topic of aquaculture. Uh, we, uh, in this pilot, we intend to bring uh, uh, the current service that we already uh, partially have, that is Reticus Aquaculture Service, we want to bring it from TRL 7 to TRL 9. Uh, this service is currently under development for plants in high sea, and uh, uh, it is under demonstration also in Adriatic Sea. We want to announce it and to bring it again to the market, uh, to the market TRL 9. Uh, by developing and validating an, uh, uh, specific algorithms uh, that uh, will make it available both in the IFC and the near coast. Indeed, we intend to uh, um, develop specific algorithms again by making use of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data. As you know, we don't have... Uh, satellite uh, uh, good uh, satellite data and information uh, uh, close to shoreline. Uh, also, CMAMS did that, that don't give us the opportunity to have uh, this kind of product. So uh, we need uh, uh, to to introduce also this new aspect from the technical point of view. And uh, uh, this will be done uh, exploiting both the Planetech uh, expertise and also Blue Farms expertise that is in our partner in this new pilot. Um, the, the service, uh, so uh, using satellite data and uh, uh, derived measurements of water parameter and uh, also forecast modeling, uh, we will provide information uh, about uh, mass cells growth rate uh, consisting in a weekly bulb 
bulletin uh, with the indicators related to the um, weight of the masses for each plant, uh, for, uh, related also to the uh, dimension and the length of the, the, the muscles. The, this activity will be done uh, uh, together with uh, the user that we have involved in this project, that, that is uh, the uh, aquaculture, uh, the Association Mediterranean Aquaculture, that is the most important uh, uh, user in Italy for the, for the shellfish uh, and fish uh, uh, aquaculture. And um, yes, th this is uh, basically the, the idea. That, Thank uh, you very much for that. Thanks, thanks, uh, Daniela. That's indeed a very good uh, overview. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're running a bit of out of time in, in, in the session, but I'm, uh, I'm sure that now the colleagues from different pilots are aware uh, uh, of what you're bringing into the, um, to the showcase. We'll, we'll, you'll, you'll probably be involved in the different or most in the different showcase meetings. We'll get to know each other, and uh, we'll be able to provide some input and some feedback and uh, interact a bit uh, with you. And uh, uh, I think. Am I correct in Arco? Are you responsible for the other pilot? Maybe not. I'm not sure if, okay. Maybe I'm mistaken. So, sorry? I'm, uh... Ah, sorry, I, okay. Hi, Nuno. Yes, Annalise, she's the, um, she's the ah, sorry uh, about that. responsible for water insight. Marnix sorry wasn't about able that. To uh, <laughs> okay, okay. I know. Sorry, sorry. Can you provide just a, a small overview and uh, present yourself? Uh, yes. Well, I'm Annelies Hommersom. Uh, yesterday, I saw uh, our director, uh, Marnix Lerner, but he had already an appointment for today. Um, so he introduced a bit about our uh, pilot for uh, LG biomass monitoring for the Water Framework Directive. Uh, the Water Framework Directive is a, a European-wide um, regulatory framework uh, to uh, improve water quality uh, in inland and coastal waters. Um, the idea is that all, all the member states have to monitor water quality and have to provide the, um, the information about that in a, in a certain standardized way. If the water quality is not good for that, they compare to uh, standards that are made based on well, the originally expected water quality or older data from a few decades ago, where they know the water was still in a, like an original state. And uh, if the water quality is not good, they're supposed to take uh, measures and then monitor again, of course, to see if the water quality improved based on the measures that were, have been taken. At this moment, the, the standard uh, water quality monitoring for um, well, the, the, water, the water framework directive monitors an enormous range of parameters. But on the base of the, the food chain is uh, LG biomass. And one of the other parameters that is very important for the life of the water is the transparency. We focus on the, the LG biomass and we measure that in the form of chlorophyll based on earth observation data. Um, this product has partly been based on the developments we made in the project, uh, H2020 project Eo Morris. So we got to a uh, TRL of seven. And uh, the acceptance is the next step that is on the list. And that's the, the most important we want to achieve within each, each shape. Um, because at this moment, many member states uh, subscribe which methods are compulsory to use for monitoring the biomass which is a standard uh, going to the, to the field, taking a sample, processing it in the laboratory. And for many parameters that is indeed needed, but for chlorophyll, uh, we think it would be much better to use a combination. We also have two users involved, uh, one from an Estonian Institute and one from a, a Dutch agency who are responsible for carrying out the monitoring. And they say, well, we take one sample in a lake uh, that is not very representative at all. And uh, yeah, it would be much better to have spatial information included as well. But that must be included in uh, the national uh, regulations uh, of how the water framework directive is implemented. Um, that new methods should also be allowed uh, if we can prove that the quality is good, et cetera, et cetera, of course. Um, and we hope that within uh, eShape, uh, with this big group of um, institutes involved in earth observation, we can reach a mass to uh, speak to organizations like, 
like uh, IPA or so to explain how useful it could be to implement these new methods in, uh, in the frameworks. Thank you very much, Annelies. Uh, we are really running out of time on the session, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, but, no, no, uh, no, no, we have, yes. we, have a, we have added extra five minutes so that you don't Perfect. have... Perfect. Thanks a lot, Panatis. So, uh, uh, Annelies, uh, thanks for your for the inputs and for the presentation on, on your pilot. Uh, similar to, to Daniela, we hope to, to uh, be able to um uh, to interact with you in the, in the showcase meetings and to get to know better and help to design to develop your 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 pilot um so we have this 10 extra minutes i wanted because i i made a point of having someone from wp4 and wp5 present in this uh in this uh, in this session so that they can present a bit what's foreseen so because we've been mostly focused on on, on wp2 and wpc so co-design and implementation you're not looking so much into the user uptake and sustainability, although it's a key aspect of the development of these applications. And so I, I, I asked uh, to Francesca from YASC and Nico from Evenflow to be present to present a bit what is foreseen for the next uh, milestones within eShape and what eShape can can how eShape can help them with the user uptake and sustainability. I see that Francesca has a um, mic. I don't. I think Nico um, does not. Can you hear me? Francesca, maybe, yes, we can. We okay, can. We okay. Can go on. Good. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks, Nuno. Thanks for for inviting me in your um, in your breakout sessions. And uh, um, it's it's a pleasure to meet also the the new pilots and uh, and see how with the current pilots, for example, with uh, Patrick's from uh, Five P Two um, and uh, and Mark who been very supporting for the onboarding process and also for um, user uptake engagement, especially in workshops uh, that took part um, last week. So um, this is also a very good opportunity to, to, to give a small overview of what our um, work package for is about. I'm uh, Francesca Piatt and I'm uh, with Emmanuel Pajot. I'm the coordinator of work package four about user uptake, uh, um, capacity building and uh, institutional liaison. Um, what's this about? So the overarching aim of this uh, VP4 is really the promotion of the pilots projects at uh, national and international scale, and especially among key um, user communities, um, making pilots more globally accessible and uh, inc inc increasing the market uptake of the, of the pilots. And this will be done through three tasks, uh, which is the first one is the user uptake. So it's really approaching a pool of new uh, users. The second one is capacity building in cooperation with the uh, VP5, which uh, my colleague Nico will explain later. And then uh, uh, the third goal, institutional alignment. So this is really about liaising with uh, other stakeholders, institutional stakeholders um, and users community that can act actually as a multiplayers um, to leverage the efforts of uh, user, user engagement activities. And uh, this VP4 is really is, uh, is led by ERSC, the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies, uh, with the support uh, of Evenflow, Armin, Noah, and other, uh, of course, uh, um, showcase leaders. Um, in terms of, uh, of actions and interactions uh, uh, for the first, uh, uh, for the future milestone, um, for the first task about the user uptake is really going to be focused about challenges. So uh, the important thing for me is really to engage with the pilots in order to uh, finalize the last two um, uh, tickets that are open on the support service uh, um, office with the Marie Francoise. So there are two tickets that are still open, one with the uh, pilot two and one with pilot three. And uh, um, the interaction then would be exactly to um, to interact with the pilots about these challenges, verify which would be there be uh, the future ones for the second uh, for the second sprint. So really to understand why they choose these kind of challenges and how we can actually help them. And then uh, exactly exactly this um, fine tune the work synergies with VP2 with VP3 VP2 sorry um, to find potential users exactly for the co-design methodology. So in terms of of what's to offer for user uptake is this one and uh, connected with the workshops. Um, uh, that is really the really important uh, uh, methods for uh, um, user uptake and interact with pilots and your new user of communities. Example has been the ESHIP uh, Space Climate Observatory webinar that we had last week where uh, Patrick Matjen, Matjen um, introduced uh, um, his pilots to um, the SCO communities. And then for the new uh, um, Q1 and Q2 in uh, 
next year there will be of course more workshops about which I would like to engage with uh, with you. Um, to start to start with institutional liaison instead, uh, we've been working already uh, in terms of institutional liaison with uh, different institution, EU institutions and community of users. Um, there will be new let's say projects and prospect that I will be able to, to share with you in some more times and uh, future interactions will be uh, brought forward in these terms um, and they're always linked to um, to the sprint too so when uh, the pilots are actually having the, the challenges. Um, I will conclude uh, just with the uh, um, capacity building in EO Wiki which is this, plat this online platform uh, um, developed by ERSC and uh, um, I asked already some pilots to provide some success stories because these success stories are actually a very good uh, implementation method to share uh, the, the potential of these uh, um, pilot projects. So in the future as well, uh, it will be um, if uh, your pilots are uh, more mature as well to share in terms of success stories, I will be happy to uh, to receive them in order to publish them. So I hope I, I made, I made a, a sort of framework um, clear and uh, I'm open for questions by email or through through this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you. I open to the, the, the floor to anyone that wants to, to, to ask something to Francesco or to contribute to the discussion in terms of his uptake. Ilias. I, I could ask, I mean, if, uh, well, it's, it's more like a wish. If we could have um, a, an email from you, Francesca, with the kind of like milestones for the next yes. year, like with dates, what needs, what is expected from us? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, to give to give to you, so we can have for the me, overview for next year. Absolutely, I will provide you this. Uh, and for me, it's exactly in terms of um, of, of, of actions uh, that are very important are um, the year with success stories, but also um, I very well understand the mature of your pilots really to. To, to use your material that you already have that I can share and promote in order to um, to bring forward the user uptake and also in terms of institutional liaison be able to really show how the pilot is uh, um, is important to, uh, to, to, to to uptake let's say also in terms of institutional liaison and what these pilots can bring to, uh, to new markets and to new user communities. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I know that you already shared with me your success story. So this is something you did already. <laughs> <laughs> so good job. <laughs> uh, we hope so. We hope that there, there are many. Uh, I think Nico, I, I see Nico that you don't have a microphone. So maybe it's your microphone. The microphone's on, can you hear me? Ah, we yeah. can. Sorry, I was, seeing, I was seeing Nico there, but uh, no, no, no I, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm in here twice. I had some, some technical problems. So it's, it only works for me with the Zoom apps and um, okay, Nico, maybe, maybe you, can, you can talk a bit about WP5, uh, similar to what Francesca was inputting for WP4. Yes, so, so Work Package 5 is about sustainability and uh, market penetration support, so, so also related to the user uptake, so of the products and services that you are going to develop. And uh, that mainly follows also the, the structured approach using the sustainability sheets that I believe all the pilots have been provided with. So we would analyze first, well, if you want to have a user uptake, you first have to know what is the total addressable market of, of potential users, what is the serviceable uh, available market uh, of potential users for the specific solution that you have and what is the serviceable obtainable market. So one first has to follow uh, this a bit a structured approach to, to identify who are the potential users to then, um, develop a strategy how to address them and uh, the support services in work package 5 would support you in doing that in uh, in uh, developing that uh, uh, strategy and in developing also your yeah, means to to then uh, approach the, the market that you have identified for yourself which could also be yeah communication activities um, matchmaking activities. So, so the first step is really to fill out these sustainability sheets, uh, which you can do with, with uh, our support. And other aspects are then related within Work Package 5 to also the intellectual property, uh, the one that you develop yourself and own, and, and how to deal with IP 
of, of third parties that you might need to integrate into your uh, solution. And uh, we also offer, yeah, all for the website sustainability.eshape.eu uh, information services that, that should help you to, to shape your products and services towards uh, market needs. So, so, we, so there's uh, a bit of uh, market intelligence and technology intelligence information available uh, and, uh, and a growing pool of information through our website. And you can reach out to ask uh, to us in, uh, at the moment where you think you are you are ready to to commercialize your idea or to to um, uh, reach out to maybe also investors that you might need to to uh, uh, go to scale up your product or service beyond the eShape uh, project. And then you would approach us, and we would give the the guidance that would be very specific in 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 the context of each of these pilots. So so also what what user types would be would be very different for each of, of uh, the different pilots. Uh, so, so some would be certain public bodies. Uh, some would be very specific public bodies. So it's a it's a it's a very small group maybe of of uh, potential users that you can target. And uh, others might be even in the private sector in the tourism uh, sector. Um, so, so. It would be an individual consultation with each with each with each of your pilots. Okay, uh, thanks, Nico. I, I oh, just have one question. I, don't know. I, think, I think we're out of time. Thank you, Nuno. Ah, we are out of time. Much. Okay, Panate. Thank you, everyone, for participating. So oh, we you. see each other in the in the in the in the plenary session following. Okay, bye bye. See you. Bye 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 bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.